Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. My name is Christina Fox, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Tech Alliance. As the Regional Innovation Centre for Southwestern Ontario, Tech Alliance is the place for dreamers, innovators, and world-changing ideas. We're focused on building an inclusive and globally competitive innovation economy that en enables entrepreneurship, spurs accelerated growth, attracts ambitious talent and new companies, and we do this with you in mind. Through our advisory services, our accelerator and experiences like these with partners and participants like you, we are working together to ensure recovery and prosperity. Showcasing our commitment to founders and entrepreneurs across the West, such as today's masterclass on leading product teams. And we seek rock star thought leaders to deliver what you need most. With support by community partners, we're able to bring you such insightful, relevant, and robust experiences. And to that end, I want to thank Interval for sponsoring this Tech Alliance Masterclass. Interval has been pushing the limits on building businesses with useful information and financial decision-making advice for over 10 years through business valuations in an interactive and custom customizable scenario format. Uh, known for delivering real value in real time, Interval is the perfect partner for this masterclass. So before we get started, let me share a few key points. Everyone is muted today on this webcast and the webcast will be recorded and available after the call. If you'd like to keep up with everything there is to know about Southwestern Ontario's innovation economy, sign up for our weekly newsletter. The link will be dropped in the chat. So leadership is a position made complicated by many faceted roles and relationships that a manager must juggle. Product managers need to balance empowering their teams while creating a work environment that enables each team member to cultivate and capture their personal best. Today, we uncover common obstacles in the way of effective leadership and how to successfully work towards bettering your skills and abilities in leading product teams with pointers and ideas from a true industry pro. Now, let me introduce today's speaker, Patrick Gregory. I've had the opportunity to get to know Patrick and I'm absolutely delighted that he is leading this masterclass. Patrick is a product executive, consultant, and speaker. And after starting his career as a musician and graphic designer in the 90s, and after a brief time in the agency world, Patrick spent 10 years managing user experience and design teams in the financial services industry. For the last five years, Patrick has developed a unique skill set in building and scaling product teams with startups, growth companies, and large enterprises. He is currently the director of product at Interval, a software as a service provider in the FinTech space. He holds a master's degree in library and information sciences from Western University. So at Tech Alliance, we do have a common belief between our board, our staff, and our entrepreneurs and residents, and the entire technology community that in pursuit of creating spaces where innovation thrives, we are focused on amplifying leaders in their fields. And we are thrilled to have Patrick here to share his expertise. Patrick, thanks for joining us. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Christina. Uh, everybody hear me okay there? All right. Uh, hey, folks, and welcome. Thanks so much for attending the webinar today. Uh, and thanks to Tech Alliance for having me speak. Uh, this is the fourth in a series of product, product talks that I've given in the last couple of years. Uh, some of the other ones have been building and scaling product teams, product growth for startups, product manager versus project manager. And but this talk today is focused on leadership and product teams. So and really the goal with all my product presentations is to provide you with as much valuable knowledge as possible. So that my presentations tend to be crammed with a lot of good material. Um, the last page of my slide deck has a number of product resources listed. If you're interested, I encourage you to download the slides at my website, patrickgregory.com forward slash slides. And I hope that our discussion today contains some useful information that you can use to build amazing products through better leadership. So let's kind of dive in here. So why should you listen to me? Uh, who am I in all this, right? Um, I've spent the last four years working with startups at different stages of growth. I've also spent 10 years before that working in enterprise software development. Um, so I've really seen the entire spectrum of product teams, large and small, good and bad examples alike. And I've seen what leadership techniques work and don't really work across the board. And so today, if there's one phrase that I want you to come away with, it's that great leadership is the fuel that powers amazing product teams and companies. So product led organizations are nothing without successful product teams and leadership is perhaps the most important component here. 
Um, we're also going to cover a lot of complicated moving parts in today's talk and to run with the engine metaphor for a minute, uh, all of these components that we'll be discussing need to be operating in balance and harmony with one another in order for your team to achieve that peak engagement and performance. And you can relax because that's the last time I'm going to use the engine metaphor in this whole session today. Um, but I have a really good quote here from uh, product guru Marty Kagan, which stresses the importance of leadership in product, especially in product led growth companies. And that is really that everything depends on strong pr product leaders because these people are essentially responsible for everything. Um, in product led growth, your, your product is doing most of the heavy lifting and everything flows from that. So you better have a strong foundation to grow your business using great leadership techniques. And so the high level format for our discussion today is really simple. It's got two parts. Uh, in the first part, we'll look at the problems in product management that are the, that are the result of poor leadership. Uh, and then in the second part, we'll look at how leadership can solve these problems. So this is the part of the presentation where we're going to get all the problems out on the table. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it's a bit of a long list. This is probably the most boring part of the presentation, but I'm sure that you'll probably recognize some of these problems from your own personal experiences. Um, so let's dive in here. So first, let's acknowledge that product managers and product people in general have a really tough job. There are a number of limitations within the role specifically that contribute to potential problems developing. And so let's look at some of these problems that product managers face. The first one is implicit versus explicit leadership. And what do I mean by this? This is if you're a product manager, you really aren't the boss of anybody. You can't incentivize or tell people kind of exactly what to do. They don't and they shouldn't report to you. So you have to develop lateral leadership skills in order to be successful in the role. And that can be really challenging for a lot of people. The next one is large and diverse groups. So if you're a product manager and you're working in a cross-functional team like a scrum team or a squad, you can be working with many different roles, skill sets, personality types and backgrounds. And it's amazing to have this diversity on your team um, you've usually got front end and back end developers, designers and researchers. And then outside your product team, you've got sales, marketing, customer success, your executive leadership and potentially many other stakeholders. So navigating this large group dynamic and understanding the different perspectives, needs, wants uh, of each individual group can be very difficult, especially for new product managers. The next one involves your lack of ability to participate in team selection. So you don't really have a say often in how the team is made up. You might have people come and go from the team dynamic, which can disrupt the stability of your team. And you usually don't have much to say in who gets hired or who gets assigned to your team. And you're also challenged with this dual role nature of being a contributor and a leader at the same time. So you need to discover and deliver the right product for your customers in ways that work for your business, but you also need to coach and mentor teammates to provide context, a vision for where the product is going and the important milestones your team is working towards. Uh, and so not only do you have this dual role where you're a contributor and a leader, but you have multiple different forms of leadership that you need to provide as a product manager. So uh, at each of these, you know, there's different levels of this and on the top, you've kind of got vision where you need to communicate and inspire the team with a sound direction for where things are going. Then there's the strategic level where you need to paint a picture of how the team will reach that vision through road mapping, setting objectives, establishing priorities and milestones. And then there's the tactics where you need to coordinate the day to day activities, tasks, rituals and processes that will make your team effective. And so on top of all the challenges that individual product managers face in the role, we also have operational challenges or symptoms that emerge when product leadership is lacking at the operational level. So look at, let's look at some of those operational problems. First one is organizational silos. This is like the hoarding of information or lack of information sharing that creates knowledge gaps between teams and departments where nobody really knows what other people are doing. Um, and it really demonstrates a lack of alignment between your teams and departments, which leads directly into no shared understanding of the goals you're trying to achieve as a team. 
And so perhaps your executive leadership, your board of directors or your investors are frustrated with the pace at which your teams are able to deliver new product. And perhaps there's a frustration within your company that you're spending a lot of money on product development and not getting anything in return. And then you may have noticed you're not generating the kind of business value and customer value that you were anticipating as well. And then maybe worse, it's you have flat out bad product launches that fail to hit the mark. Maybe nobody ends up caring about the product that you spent so much time making. And then maybe you're lacking a product vision that everybody in the company can get engaged and excited about um, internally. And this is something that's often lacking in large enterprise organizations is that they don't do a very good job of communicating the vision for individual product lines. They do an okay job of communicating the company mission, but they don't break it down a little bit clearer for their products. And you could also be missing a coherent roadmap that provides guidance on how to achieve your goals. And this is the big one that I've seen in many organizations also, it's lack of prioritization. So there are a million things that could be done but you don't know what the priorities are or how those priorities should be chosen. And there's one more, which is the worst one for culture, which is, and maybe it's you yourself are viewed as a micromanager, or maybe you report to a micromanager in this traditional command and control structure. And so all of these symptoms lead to bad culture and disengaged teams. And we often call this the mercenary mentality because People in the organization are viewed as like hired guns, those who just kind of simply are paid to show up and code or design wireframes or execute on that core functionality of their job. And that's all they're really valued for. So we can't rely on this old leadership methodology anymore. Um, many organizations still use the carrot and the stick mentality uh, when rewarding or punishing performance. And I hear a lot of stuff like we're a performance based company talk out there and it really needs to shift from individual performance to team performance. And I just read this really bad mission statement published a couple of weeks ago by the CEO of Coinbase, which is a cryptocurrency company and it demonstrates that a lot of companies, even modern startups still haven't learned to move past these sort of outdated leadership and management management methods. Um, so you probably found yourself nodding your head in agreement to some of, what, some of what I talked about there, which means one thing is clear. A lot of companies that I've worked with and that I'm sure you've worked with have these challenges. And all of these challenges have one thing in common. They can be solved by good product leadership. And I firmly believe that. So how do we solve these challenges? Uh, I'm gonna show you a lot of the key components that you'll need to become great product leaders here. Um, if you take all the things we're going to talk about, create some checklists, some frameworks around introducing these uh, ideas at your organization, you will absolutely become a more successful product leader. And so we're going to look at three solutions today, kind of high level, and I'm going to go into detail of each one of these. And the first one is motivation, which is creating the conditions for positive individual behaviors to emerge. And it's those positive behaviors that will ignite individual passions to achieve your company goals. The second is influence, which is your ability as a product leader to achieve your desired goals by building agreement and alignment across different groups of stakeholders. And the third is what I call sense, which is a combination of domain knowledge, understanding and creativity. And sense is how well you're able to combine these elements to identify opportunities that translate into strategy and tactics that then will align with your company's mission and vision. So what are the different ways we can motivate our product teams? And to borrow a phrase from the legendary venture capitalist, John Doerr, it starts with this idea of creating missionaries. If all the problems that we talked about before create mercenaries and we want to avoid that, what are the things we need to do in order to create missionaries within our product and technology teams? Missionaries are highly motivated individuals with high morale that are constantly learning and have a passion for solving customer problems. And missionaries also um, truly seek out uh, what will work and generate value for your business. 
And I like to look at motivation as a spectrum. And there's a good acronym that we can apply here, which is RAMPS. And that's rhythm, autonomy, mastery, purpose, and safety. And I'm gonna talk about each of these kind of individually. So let's start with rhythm. Rhythm is probably the hardest part of motivation to define, but it exists on three levels. So finding the right rhythm at work is about feel and requires lots of trial and error. Um, so you need to allow your team time to experiment and provide their feedback on defining rhythms. And seeking out healthy rhythms requires constant communication between individuals, teams, and departments. And it also requires a lot of self-reflection in order to establish a good rhythm. And on the foundation layer, we've got individual rhythms, which is, it's really about your team members feeling good about the pace of the work and the things that they're working on. Do they have agency over the work that they're doing? And how well are they able to complete that work day to day without distraction? And it's about finding a healthy tension in release in the work and not having all tension all the time. There always should be a, a block of release to go with a block of tension. And team rhythms are about um, aligning those individual rhythms with a group dynamic. So. Uh, your developers get, you know, an example might be your developers get driven nuts by the fact that they have to hold all their code for a certain release or something like that. Um, you know, does your team feel good about doing product demos every week or would it be better if they did product demos every two weeks or three weeks or something like that? Um, you know, does your daily stand up meaning always interfere with your team's morning productivity routines? Like, does the team have a coffee break or something like that? Um, this is a small example, but we recently moved our daily stand up uh, where I work uh, by about 15 minutes so folks could get their kids set up on remote learning for school in the morning. And it seems like a small thing to mention, but you should always be reflecting on how you improve those team rhythms at a granular level. And it's making your team just that much sharper. And you shouldn't be afraid to make those changes regularly. The third level is organizational rhythm. And organizational rhythm is like the most difficult to impact because it requires a lot of influence. Um, an example would be that maybe your company culture and your organizational rhythms have a negative impact on your team dynamic. Um, and an example would be that maybe your company doesn't do all hands meetings or maybe they do too many all hands meetings. Um, and maybe those get in the way of the certain rhythms that your team has already established. Um, and it's possible for negative organizational rhythms to impact individual rhythms. So Facebook, for example, has so many organizational and ethical problems these days that you can tell it's like really affecting the day to day rhythm of the people who work there, like if you're on Twitter and stuff. And remote remote working causes even more challenges and potential disruptions to finding good rhythms because teams don't have shared locational experience they're operating in different worlds, right? So your team members have their kids at home, which might almost certainly uh, be throwing off their rhythms. So leading product teams requires you to be proactive in helping individuals, teams, and your organization to find these healthy rhythms. And you need to actively seek out feedback and engage in self-reflection at every level. So let's talk about autonomy next. Um, in 2009, Daniel Pink published a book called Drive, which explains the science behind autonomy and motivation. And there's also a really good TED talk about this. And the scientific research shows that human beings have an innate inner drive to be autonomous, self-determined and connected to one another. And so surprisingly, many businesses have continued to ignore this research for years. And providing autonomy for your teams doesn't just work alone. You have to provide it in conjunction with um, what's called alignment. And so if there's one slide that has consistently been a part of all the product talks I've ever given, it's this idea of aligned autonomy from Heinrich Nieberg. Heinrich is a well-known thought leader in product management. He's worked with Spotify to improve their process. And now he's a developer at Minecraft. Um, this two by two matrix here shows that aligned autonomy is really at the heart of what allows product led companies to achieve scale. So let's look at this in detail. Um, on the axis, you have alignment and autonomy ranging from high to low. And we want to be consistently up in that green circle. Um, but let's look at the other options open to us here. So low autonomy 
And low alignment is a micromanagement culture. It's the worst form of culture. Teams, um, and honestly, you probably won't be able to attract a lot of top talent to work in this environment. So let's cross that one out. High alignment and low autonomy is the very definition of command and control culture. And so we also want to avoid this one at all possible. And so both of these squares in the matrix, uh, you know, create a mercenary culture and that's what we want to avoid, right? So high autonomy, but low alignment is more of a chaotic culture where teams are free to explore, but they're probably not achieving the desired business goals because they're all over the place with no structure aligning them. So as a startup, you might have more engaged teams in this model, but you could probably burn through your cash reserves pretty quickly if this is your culture right here. The top right square is where we want to be, and that's uh, providing high level goals and objectives to create that alignment and allow teams the autonomy to figure out how to achieve those goals. So the product leader's job in aligned autonomy is to avoid those command and control tendencies and to facilitate healthy conditions for teams to thrive while, of course, maintaining accountability. And I can tell you, I've seen this so many times where, you know, product leaders fill up their team's queue with so much work and the flow in the system just grinds to a halt. So, you know, you should really strive to have your teams have at least 20% of their time free uh, to be able to learn and develop their skills or take on urgent tasks that may come up suddenly that were not anticipated. Um, this is one of the biggest challenges I've seen with a lot of organizations. Um, when your teams have 20% free time kind of as a benchmark, work actually flows faster through the system. It's a bit of a paradox, but that's how it works. And your folks are more engaged and organized as a result. And the third part of motivation is mastery. As individuals, we want to know that the work we're doing to build amazing products is also leading us to grow as individuals in alignment with something we personally value. And we want to know that we're gracefully pushing the limits of our own skills and leveling up ourselves in the process. And part of product leadership is encouraging your team members to take on new and exciting challenges, as well as learn and discover new ways of doing things. And so the fourth ingredient in motivation is purpose. Purpose is what drives your product team to persevere through those feel bad rhythms. And purpose is the reason why your team exists just beyond shipping that new product or that feature. Purpose is painting a picture of why the work you're doing is meaningful to your customers. Um, and it's your job when leading product teams to consistently reiterate the purpose behind the work and how it connects directly with your company's mission and vision. And it's this Japanese concept of Ikigai, which um, I find really great that you can apply to teams. And it basically translates to your reason to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, Ikigai combines passion, mission, profession, and vocation, and is a great way to frame the motivational purpose. And as a product leader, it's really your job to find out what your team members are good at, what they're passionate about, and what's their true mission. And are they following their vocation or... Are they able to expand and take on new opportunities and different roles and, and learn new things? And so the last key ingredient in motivation is safety, often referred to as psychological safety. And as product leaders, we're responsible for ensuring that our product is feasible, viable, and desirable. And we're often placed in the position of having to stand between executive stakeholders or other departments um, who are trying to drive the product roadmap. And we often need to shield our teams from corporate crap or swoop and poop uh, in order to ensure that our teams have the time to explore and experiment with new ways of working, that they have the right people, tools, and processes to be successful, and that they're allowed to participate in defining success and that they're measured against uh, those, those success criteria in terms of outcomes and not just tossing features over the wall. And that they have the support of senior leadership to pivot in new directions based on things that they've learned. And so creating safety is to reduce fear within your, your team. And the sci-fi nerd in me always goes to the character of Paul Atreides in Dune who says fear is the mind killer. 
And so Amy Edmondson has written a really good book about reducing fear in your organization. And the following a list of things you can do uh, as a product leader to remove or reduce fear. And that's really demonstrating that humility, expressing appreciation, um, listening well, asking good questions. You know, you want to destigmatize failure and look at it as an opportunity to course correct. Um, you know, and you really want to encourage continuous learning and exploring of new opportunities. It's also really important to provide guardrails so people can clearly understand the constraints that your team is dealing with. And so there's a really great quote that summarizes psychological safety. It's fear driven teams may give you their hands and their heads, but never their hearts. And this is really the essence of the missionary versus mercenary mentality. And if anyone can guess the movie reference uh, in this image here, you all get the bonus points for the webinar. So feel free to throw your guests into the chat. Uh, the next major topic that we're going to address in leading product teams is influence. And so good product leaders are influencers. Their influence is made up of a series of skill sets. It's good communication skills. It's the ability to build trust. Um, it's the ability to negotiate with others. And finally, it's the ability to collaborate and facilitate collaboration between individuals and groups. And so when talking about influence, there's, you know, let's start with communication. So there's three types of communication that product leaders have to engage in. And each type of communication requires a slightly different uh, approach. So horizontal communication really involves communicating with your peers across the organization. So obviously your product team and your technology folks, but also departments such as sales, marketing, customer success, and then there's vertical communication, which requires you to engage with different individuals up the hierarchical chain. These could be your C-suite leadership, but also investors, stakeholders, or your board of directors. And external communication requires you that you engage with individuals outside of your organization. So for product managers, this should be first and foremost customers, or maybe it's third party vendors or data providers or something like that. But frequent and clear communication should be tailored to your audience and it's a vital skill in leadership so for example you wouldn't want to go down the rabbit hole you know talking about engineering and devops to your c-suite or your chief product officer or your ceo um, you wouldn't want to talk agile and lean processes to your board of directors um, you want to make sure that you're communicating in a language that they understand And so the first and most important rule, and it should go without saying, but it often doesn't, is don't be an asshole. <laughs> Ditch the ego in communicating with others and show vast amounts of empathy. You know, be authentic. It's important to be self-aware and emotionally intelligent and honest when engaging with people. And encourage that reciprocity. So ensure that your communication is not a one-way dialogue. It's really important to provide context. Um, you know, make sure that your when you're communicating, it's not implicit communication, but that you're communicating explicitly. So there's no misunderstandings about how your message is being interpreted. And this is so important, especially as a lot of us are working remotely, is like be complimentary and liberal with praise. Encourage asynchronous communication where possible. Um, you know, as you know, we want to make sure that we communicate in a way that allows people the freedom and the flexibility to get their work done and not always be responding to emails or video call meetings. So it's also important to provide evidence of, you know, to back up your case. This is that kind of show don't tell uh, mentality. You want to be an active listener and you want to make sure that your communication style is tailored to a specific um, approach. So, you know, if you can use video to communicate something to a certain group a lot simpler, that's a great approach. You should try that and feel free to, you know, experiment with your communication methods. So being an influencer means building trust, um, which is the next section here we're going to talk about. It's important to establish trust with all of the stakeholder groups that you engage with. And even if you don't necessarily get along with everyone, they need to be able to trust you. Um, and have your back regardless how, of how they feel about you. And this requires a lot of communication and a lot of work to sort of 
especially with people that you don't necessarily get along with, you have to really go that extra mile and, um, you know, engage. And in terms of understanding how trust breaks down, I recommend this book called The Trusted Advisor um, by David Meister. This book presents an equation for how trust is sort of formulated here, which is credibility plus reliability plus intimacy divided by self-orientation. So let's unpack this a little bit here. And so a good way to frame this is um, with credibility, it's that I can trust what this person says about something. Uh, reliability is that I can trust this person to do something. Um, intimacy is that I feel comfortable discussing something with this person. And self-orientation is that I trust this person cares about something beyond their own self-interest. And so being an influencer means being good at no negotiation. Um, negotiation is often defined as the art of someone getting someone else to kind of have your way. Um, but I prefer to define it as a discussion between two or more people to reach a mutually beneficial agreement. And to expand on this a little, the people involved in the negotiation generally have constraints, priorities, needs and wants that need to be taken into consideration. And so as a product manager, you need to become skilled at learning negotiation skills. And I highly recommend a book called Never Split the Difference by former FBI Chris, uh, hostage negotiator, Chris Voss. And this will help you gain a better understanding of negotiation techniques. This book does a great job of explaining how to use empathy and active listening to turn any negotiation into a collaborative problem solving exercise. So reframing the negotiation in that you're both solving a, a problem. And so being an influencer means being really good at collaboration. And I've added a second great quote here from Marty Kagan is that getting good uh, at true collaboration is at the heart of how strong product managers work. And so product managers don't lead by authority, we lead by influence. So parting, part of leading by influence is to ensure that compelling opportunities are discovered. And that means bringing everyone along in the organization. So good collaboration is integral to this process and it involves having the right skill sets, solving the right part of the problem. So you wanna let the designer solve the problem and the developer solve the problem. You don't wanna be solving problems for all these different groups. So collaboration is an opportunity to make your case, but it's an also an opportunity to hear other perspectives. And the ultimate goal of collaboration is to move your product forward in the best way possible to meet the business needs. And leading healthy collaboration supports your ability to influence across the entire company. And so I've listed some good collaboration reminders here. Don't be the expert. Uh, model and share good collaboration across your company so that other teams can benefit from the cross pollination of ideas. Collaborate on business and customer outcomes and not just about throwing features over the wall or building new features. Um, and don't create handoff requirements. Allow the team to use their unique skill to help define that and solve those problems. So we're in the home stretch, uh, time check here, uh, all, all good. Um, third solution that we're gonna use to make you kick ass product leaders is Sense. Um, and so I like to define that as your domain knowledge, um, understanding and creativity. And so having good sense as a product manager means understanding the following areas. And let's talk about customer sense. So customer sense is about understanding customer segments, pain points, and problems. Strategic sense is about knowing how to put milestones in place that will help you achieve the mission, vision, and purpose. And that tactical sense is knowing how to respond to the day-to-day -day activities and needs of the team. Data and insights is being able to support good decisions by translating product data into positive actions and outcomes. And technology sense is understanding the art of the possible and being able to speak the language of technology with your team. So let's talk about customer sense here. Everyone claims to be customer centric in today's business world, even the largest and slowest moving of the traditional businesses have shifted their mindset to a customer centric perspective. But if you look closely, it's fairly easy to tell between those who truly value customer problems and those that don't. 
And I've seen examples of companies that claim to be customer centric and they spend millions of dollars building CX teams and departments only not, and then they don't let their product teams actually connect with the customers because maybe the sales organization owns that relationship or something. So successful product leadership requires customer problems and their pain points to be brought directly into the day-to-day -day conversations with your team and placed front and center in the discussion. Um, the best product discovery coaches out there all agree that talking to your customers on a weekly basis is the first step in building products that can actually solve problems for people and deliver real value. And when I tell that to people, they get alarmed because a lot of companies don't really talk to customers every week, but that should be the goal that you're striving for. Uh, focusing on the customer and product discovery is a huge part in ensuring that you're building the right product and not wasting time and money by building something that somebody might not use. Um, and identify priority problems in certain segments. So focus on addressing those segments first rather than trying to please all your customers at once. Uh, you wanna really zero in on those right segments. And focus as much on keeping customers through better retention strategies as you do on trying to acquire new customers by creating new features. Um, you know, and then organize your product teams around customer experience. Uh, you know, workflows or value streams such as onboarding or search or messaging. It's good to have your teams organize around those functions. So now we move on to strategy and tactics, which is a huge topic. Um, and I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on this today because I could do my own whole talk on this. Um, being able to effectively connect, effectively connect strategy and tactics is still one of the biggest challenges I see in a lot of product organizations. Um, there's so much distraction and busyness in, in most product companies. Most teams are very reactive and they tend to focus disproportionately um, on short-term tactics. Um, and it's incredibly important to ensure that the day-to-day -day activities and tactics that you're working on are connected to a larger strategy and product vision. Um, or you'll be distracted into working on these things that are not really in line with your goals. Great product leaders are able to provide focus for the team by communicating the strategy and the tactics with equal importance um, to provide that context and direction. So you gotta be able to do what I call the product struck, strut, <laughs> uh, trademark pending on that. Um, so what do I mean by the product strut? Um, the product strut is really your ability to navigate up and down the spectrum of vision right through to the daily activities and tasks. So not all of your team members may be familiar with the path or have the context uh, or domain knowledge that you have as a product leader. Um, you know, they might not know the company mission as well. They might not know the product vision, what the OKRs are, objectives and key results. Um, it's your job as product leaders to sort of shepherd the team up and down this line and coach them and navigate, uh, you know, coach them to be able to navigate that path themselves. So as product leaders, it should be your goal to kind of moonwalk up and down this pyramid like nobody's business. Start with the vision, strategy, objectives, key results. You got to kind of maintain a good balance of all this stuff when you're working with your team. And so data, uh, data and insights. Understanding your product data can sometimes be an intimidating skill for new product managers. And it's difficult, it's difficult to grasp. So that's why it's important to simplify the process as much as possible around your data and for your team as well. So as a product manager, I hated writing SQL queries and wasting time sifting through reams of data that was disorganized or difficult to process and interpret, not to mention where to store all this data so it's easily accessible and shareable. Successful product organizations are able to come up with innovative ways to easily share and consume that qualitative and quantitative product data. And so if your company can afford to, I highly recommend investing in something called product operations as an addition to your product department. It's a new part of the org structure. Uh, product operations is a relatively new discipline uh, to the world of product management within the last couple of years. It's essentially a new function 
Um, and it's really designed to take the burden off product managers around collecting and interpret interpreting important product data. Product operations can act as the connective, connective tissue uh, between product and data science and customer success and sales um, to synthesize that valuable product data into easily consumable and actionable insights for your teams. And so, you know, that's about creating dashboards and easy to consume uh, pieces of data that you can share. But if you're still a company uh, that's not ready, ready to add product operations yet, there are some tips that can help you deal with the challenge of wrangling data and you know, work with your technology team to create those product analytics dashboards for easy to consume metrics. There's a lot of great tools out there um, that, that can help with that now. Don't be a Facebook, don't strictly rely on quantitative data. Make sure that you compare and complement that quantitative data with qualitative research and surveys. Test product capabilities before you roll them out to a wide audience and collect data on small percentages of those segments. Um, simplify the many KPIs that are important for your product department using a framework uh, such as North Star. And we're going to talk a little bit about North Star. So, North Star is a framework um, that drastically simplifies the many KPIs of your sort of product organization into one metric that everyone in your company can kind of understand and rally around. And uh, you can see here that Spotify, this is a Spotify example, how they've used North Star. Um, you know, they've distilled these many breadth, depth, and frequency metrics into a single metric, which is time spent listening to music by subscribers. Um, you know, this is an easy to consume and very shareable metric. It's also easy to report on. Uh, so it carries a lot of value in its simplicity. And so the, we're getting close to the end. So this is the last topic and it's really that the sense of technology. And if you're a product manager without a technology background, uh, it's important to involve at least one tech lead in any sort of discussion that you're having. You want to be able to understand the art of the possible um, as you work to develop that technology on your own. So the goal for product managers should really be to speak the language of technology at a high level. Um, and I highly recommend starting with this book. Uh, it's called Accelerate, Science of DevOps. It's a great book that's written in a language that non-technical PMs can understand. Um, but at, at a high level, it's important to know what the technologies uh, can do to help you achieve those outcomes that you're looking for. Um, it's less important to know the detailed inner workings of those technologies, and you can usually rely on your engineers or your developers for that. So thanks very much for hearing uh, me out today. Uh, that's, that's kind of it. Um, I guess if there's some time left, we can uh, dive into some questions. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, what an amazing um, afternoon that we've had with you as a masterclass leader. Uh, I personally have really enjoyed the content today. Um, I think of your presentation and some of the things that rang true for me were the use of drive, autonomy, acceleration, and fearlessness. And I think you covered so much ground on effect, how to effectively lead product teams. Uh, to be honest, if I took out the word product management or product, each time you, you know, had a sentence and it was applied simply to leadership, I, I think if you strip all that out at the end of the day, the lesson today was really about foundational leadership um, and autonomy and you know, diverse leadership opportunities across teams, both the horizontal, the vertical, and the external. I loved the way that you put concepts together so simply with um, images that helped the, the learner today to really assess and appreciate and begin to apply that immediately to problem solving and, and solution opportunities within their own teams, uh, no matter what the product is. So there was so much here today. I honestly could probably give you another whole hour and you'd have my <laughs> undivided attention because it was really the depth of it was so strong. Um, you know, we, of course, there's always questions that we can ask of you. Um, and so I might maybe do one question because I do realize we're at 148. Your, your timing was so good that, that uh, I almost hate to put a question in front of you because um, 
the brilliance of the experience today has been such that we could probably shut her down right now. But I'm going to ask a question because I think uh, we've got the time and, and we've got a very captive audience. So um, one, of the th one of the things I wanted to ask was, um, how do you allow everybody on the team, especially the product manager, the autonomy to solve customer problems if they don't have for example, the don domain knowledge or don't really know the industry that they're working in that well yet. Imagine a new person to the team that has maybe really solid experience in product management, but it's a, you know, a new sector to which they're participating in. And this probably pulls in a little bit of that external view um, and that you know, high-low autonomy and high-low alignment. I wonder if you can provide a, a bit of insight on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a common challenge, especially you know, in an employment market where you're, you're hiring really good people, but they may not be uh, experts in, in your particular industry, right? Um, so I definitely recommend, I, this, this really falls on the leader to support this because, um, you know, certain people have different degrees of, you know, how, um, you know, capable or interested they are in learning about an industry it's really up to the leader to help create a structured learning environment for that individual to excel and to build their domain knowledge and to really allow the time uh, for them to do that and make that part of their role uh, through coaching and, and setting aside blocks of time and, you know, dedicated coaching sessions with the leader. Um, you know, and you, you really want to actively sort of work to build that domain knowledge as part of your role as a leader. Um, you know, put dedicated learning milestones uh, in place and criteria, you know, you could even put OKRs or goals, objectives and key results around their learning, um, which will help with that. And so if you get into a nice rhythm with that and you're meeting with them regularly uh, to, to, to sort of supply them with that opportunity to learn, that's a huge uh, way, but it does fall on the leader to, to, to initiate that. Okay. And then a question a bit more, you know, for you and about you. Um, it is very clear to me that you keep up with a lot of content, contemporary teachings, um, some even legacy teachings as it relates to leadership. So for you there, you have referenced a lot of different things. How do you continue to um, be aware of um, your own leadership style and the leadership that's required to lead product teams, um, because this is something that you are doing very well in your career. And, and how do you stay organized as that product leader or maintain a balance of these different practices? Yeah, so I can give you like a very technical, tactical description of what I do to, to do that. And it's, it's it, uh, you know, maybe I'll start with that. And if you want a more kind of, you know, uh, ephemeral answer, I can give that as well. But I actually do a lot of reading and I basically carve out time in each of my day uh, to do reading. And if you look at my calendar, there's probably like at least two hours of day, a day that I've blocked for reading. Um, you know, not everyone can do that, you know, but I, I'm kind of, you know, fortunate that I, I'm able to do that. Um, you know, even if you can get, you know, half hour, 45 minutes of, of solid reading in a day. And, and what I do is I actually, use RSS feeds to subscribe to, if, if I find a news source where I'm like, oh, I really like that article, or that was a really good resource, or, you know, somebody on Twitter posted something that I find super engaging, I will sort of collect that information into an RSS feed, and I'll go through those RSS feeds, and I'll just read the headlines. I'll be like, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to use that later, and I throw it into uh, Pocket, and so Pocket is a tool that I use to just sort of store all my articles and it's got a searchable database. So it's really helpful when I'm, you know, need, you know, a problem comes up at work or, you know, uh, oh, I really need to address this, this certain thing, or I, I, I can say, oh, I can check my pocket. And it's kind of like my second brain. It's like, I can offload all of this stuff that I've already sort of flagged as useful um, to pocket and then I can search it. So um, it's about creating kind of that personal database or that second brain of information um, that really helps with the recall so that you don't have to go like searching for things in Google all the time because it's kind of hard to, to, to do that sometimes. So that's a very specific answer to your question. Um, but yeah, it's really, I just try to keep learning, keep that learning mindset. And I try to encourage people that I'm working with to always be learning. 
Awesome. I, I love it. I, I think, um, you know, when I think of the, the way that I categorize and, and continue to have my own learning environments and how I place content somewhere so that I can go back and retrieve it quickly or, you know, review the content so that I'm, you know, more brushed up on the changes that I'm trying to make in my own leadership style. There's a lot of synergy there with uh, the way that you, you gather and balance your information so that you're most effective. So thank you for taking a couple of questions here towards the end. And again, Patrick, thank you for joining us today. You've certainly opened our eyes to what we need to consider in creating and cultivating top notch product teams. And I would say generally across all teams, your experience and expertise is really invaluable. And we want to thank Interval for making this happen. Um, so again, thank you, uh, Patrick. Um, and I would thank say you. to our, our audience today, if you found this fascinating, um, and if you're left with more questions, awesome. Uh, so I would recommend that you feel free to sign up for one of our one-on-one -on -one time with experts at Interval. They're hosting an office hour session on October 21st. So it's an opportunity for anyone on this webcast to go ahead and book that time so that you can continue to explore leadership with product teams and some of the concepts that have been raised today. Uh, so that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Have an incredible day. Be well and stay safe. Thanks, Patrick.